saw a puddle on the chair and a puddle on my arm. I tried to get it. It wasn't a spider on your arm, Sarah. It was a leaf that fell down from the tree. Sarah, where are we going? Can you tell me where we're going? Um, when we were down, when we were down to the forsake, we had a cow mooing. Me well, too! Where are we going, Boo Boo? To, um, physics book. That's right. Oh. Can I have some set up? Fredericksburg, what state is that in? Mommy. Why are you hugging you? Texas. Texas. Swat them away. That's what they're there for. To... Yeah, we want to come in it. Next time. We'll um. have a car next. Uh -huh. They have trash cans here. Trash can with the trash cans. There's one there, and there's one that fell over right now. There's one there, and there's one fell over. I've been looking at that mm -hmm. trash can, but I didn't know it was a trash can. What did you think it was? A sculpture? No, I was saying. Yeah, I sent it over the cup stuff. Oh, he came back. The bell fly. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's in my... Did you add that as Miss Chewbite right there? I did. I don't know how. If he smelt your <clears throat> apple juice, he'd become. You know that? That would be like a flower to him, don't you think? <laughs> Put this in your mouth. Hey! He's not going to touch you, Sarah. He's more afraid of you than you are of him. He's just trying to find himself something to eat. Oh, see, look. He put his tongue onto that chip. That's a silly butterfly. He just doesn't even know what's good food for him and what isn't. Mommy, this is a sipper cup. I know. I put it in there because we were going on a trip and I didn't want it to spill all over the place. Good. He really likes whatever that is. Is it part of your sandwich or something, sir? Now he's going to go to your sandwich. Zip is frozen down. That's okay. Yeah. Zip. 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 Ah. You see, he's, he's eating the cheese now, huh? Isn't that the most bizarre thing? Oh, oh see. You get too much salt for your little old self, butterfly. Now he's eating all the cheese up. Oh, how much cheese could he eat? Mm, we'll eat the whole sandwich. Mm -hmm. Maybe he might come to my side. Back off, she needs her sandwich. Hey, chew, would you? We were just hanging out. We're a lot better when we really try. You guys auditioning for the TV3 talent search? No. What's that? 
What are you doing? Trust me. You live in a cave or something? I like it. She's fresh. What about this for the finale? After you fit. But look at Sarah cutting her own pancakes. Boo boo, are you eating? Oh, yes. Uh, Maybe before it gets too cold or it won't be a second. We're going to wrap it up all safe and sound so that it won't. Is this your daughter or what? <laughs> and then. Trust me, I try to dissuade them. Daddy, this is it, Texas. That's a Texas. Uh, they don't see. Hey, Dad. Hey, that's us. Oh yeah, we have to ask about these things. Okay, Grandma. Let's put a pumpkin seed up. Sure. Look at that lead hay with the dog. Look at that Santa Claus with the dog. Oh, Santa Claus is the dog. And a little... Okay, guys, I'm going to... A boy Santa Vanilla, the same kind. One more, just one. Go get it. Go get it, sir. Can you go get one? Sir? I'll go with you. Where are you going, Scott?
Tell me what it is. Ow. Here's Sarah, here's your rose. Okay. So pretty. Yeah? Daddy. Daddy, you see yeah. I plant these flowers at Texas? Yeah. Let me see them. Can you show them to me? What color are they? Hot pink and pink. Huh? What? Come up here and come down this way. Come through here. Over this one here. Yeah, I know, Daddy. What are they eating, Sarah? Look, the little bennies. What are they doing? Hopping. See? The yeah. little pink eyes. See what they do? What are your fingers in your nose for? Look at that nose, kinky. They poo pooed all here. Let's go over here.
He's down there. He was inside. <laughs> Fully automatic weapon, carried and operated by a single man. It fires a 7.7 millimeter cartridge, which is similar to the 30-06, but fires it from a 20-round banana clip magazine that inserts into the top of the piece. The coils in the barrel are necessary to cool this weapon down because of its high cyclic rate of fire, 450 rounds a minute to an effective range of 1,200 yards. The cone-shaped device at the end of the barrel is a flash suppressor and underneath it, a feature unique to Japanese machine gun. The Japanese are the only people in history to put a bayonet lug on a machine gun. <laughs> the idea was that the bonsai charge, the gunner could advance, firing the weapon while holding the pistol grip and upper handle. When his ammunition was expended, he still had a bayonet delivery device. As a bayonet delivery device, this weapon is pathetic. As a light machine gun, it's superb. And we're going to show you what it looked like to the GIs and the Marines who had to face it. Now you would seldom encounter one of these Nambus by itself. The Japanese like to practice what's called the interlocking field of fire. What that meant was, when you attack this pillbox here, you got shot at not just from that pillbox, but from that one, and three or four pillboxes over here, and three or four pillboxes over here. The enemy's intention was to lure you into a crossfire, a killing zone. So it was his turn to slaughter you for a change. Once he had you pinned down with machine guns, he would call in pre-registered concentrations of mortar and artillery fire to inflict the maximum number of casualties. This Nambu makes a very high-pitched and distinctive sound, one that GIs and Marines in the Pacific came to recognize, fear, and respect for very good reason. Demonstrate your piece. Frown! Now notice how hard it was for you to see that weapon even though you knew exactly where to look. That is not a fully camouflaged position. We have left it mostly exposed so that you can see it. On a real battlefield, a Japanese pillbox would look more like this one over to your left, completely covered with dirt and surrounded by dense foliage so that it would be all but invisible And when you walked into the field of fire of those machine guns at about a range of 500 yards. And by then, of course, it's too late. Now, the Japanese soldier using that Nambu has one more thing working for it. He believes in something called the Code of Bushido. Bushido is a Japanese word. It means the way of the warrior. The way the warrior told a Japanese soldier that death was preferable to defeat. Death was preferable to capture.
Japanese soldier was never supposed to surrender. In fact, since 1908, the laws of his country had made it illegal for him to surrender to an enemy in time of war. He was expected to fight to the death, no matter how hopeless his situation. Cut off, surrounded, sick, wounded, out of food, out of water, out of ammo. It didn't matter. He was supposed to keep fighting and killing Americans until he himself was killed. When he went into that pillbox, he knew he was never coming out of it alive. Some Japanese soldiers attended their own funerals before going into combat. For them, there was no greater glory than to die for their emperor, who they believed was a living god. To that living god, the Japanese soldier took an oath. He promised to kill ten of us before we killed him. If he could do that, if he could kill five of us for every one of him, then he stood a chance of making those islands so expensive in American lives to take that our people back home would tire of the sacrifice and accept the negotiated peace that meant an enemy victory. It was the job of our armed forces to make sure that didn't happen. But the Japanese had presented us with a problem. As far as we were concerned, what we had was a fanatic, a madman, well-armed, well-trained, well-protected, sitting inside that pillbox, and all he wanted to do was what was left of his life was take as many of us with him as he possibly could. It was our job to kill him. Kill him without losing too many of our own people. And that meant new weapons and new tactics of our own. Now believe it or not, there are ways to deal with the enemy soldiers inside those pillboxes. Specifically, there are two ways. There's the way the GIs and the Marines on the Pacific Islands did it, and then there's the way that Hollywood has done it <laughs> since the middle 1940s. One of those ways works. And I'll let you guess which one it is. <laughs> Before we talk about the real way to assault a pillbox, however, let's take a look at Hollywood's answer. And for that, we're going to bring back Sergeant Schrader. Mark II flamethrower with a Mark II flame gun. The weapon has two components, the flame gun and the tank set. The two large tanks contain the fuel, five gallons of oil mixed with gasoline. Late in the war, we started to use something called napalm, which is thickened in jelly gasoline. It sticks to anything it gets on, and it cannot be extinguished. The small tank contains the propellant, compressed air or nitrogen, under 1,200 pounds per square inch of pressure. Fully fueled, this system weighs 60 pounds on the back of its operator. Weapon has a range of 50 yards. Once the man carrying it closes to that distance, the first thing he does is squeeze the back two safeties on the handle of the flame gun. That allows the gas to push the fuel out of the tank, through the hose, and out the nozzle of the weapon. This works just like the spray nozzle on your water hose at home, except it uses gas pressure instead of water pressure. Once the fuel's leaving the front nozzle, the operator squeezes the trigger. That ignites one of six striker matches contained in a revolving cylinder in the nose of the flame gun. Striker match will burn for eight to ten seconds. It is your ignition source. It lights the fuel. This weapon shoots fire. Wrong into that nozzle, the temperature will reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyone hit by a direct burst dies instantly. A flamethrower, however, is not a weapon designed to kill individual enemy soldiers in one-on-one -on -one combat. It's designed to kill enemy soldiers defending fortified positions like this pillbox. And it does that not by burning them to death, but by asphyxiating them. Flamethrowers suffocate their victim. If the sergeant here puts 3,500 degrees worth of heat and flame into the confined space of that pillbox, he does two things very quickly. First, he uses up all the oxygen in that space in the blink of an eye. A flamethrower will literally suck the air out of its victim's lungs. Next, he creates an overwhelming amount of carbon monoxide gas, which is poisonous. If it's all you have to breathe, it will kill you. In other words, the Japanese soldiers in that pillbox are going to die very horribly, but very quickly. Flamethrowers seldom wounded anyone. If that weapon got close enough, it usually did the trick. But that's only half the tactic, the blowtorch half. After you burned a bunker out, you executed the corkscrew part of the tactic. This is the corkscrew, a satchel charge. This bag contains 25 pounds of plastic explosive or TNT, fused for five to 10 seconds. After you burn a bunker out, you ignite one or more of these and you throw it inside and you blow the bunker up. You make sure that you killed everybody in there, that you destroyed all the weapons, and hopefully you do so much damage to that position that the enemy cannot reoccupy it later. Now these are very vicious and brutal weapons. That is precisely what they are intended to be. 
This is our answer to the fanatic in the pillbox who wants to die for his emperor. Well, here's how we're going to help him keep his promise and not let him take too many of us with him in the process. The problem is these are short-range weapons, 50 yards on the flamethrower, however far I can throw on a satchel char. His Nambu has considerably more range than that. So how do we get close enough to make corkscrew and blowtorch work? Well, the answer is the combined arms assault, and that's what we're about to illustrate for you. We're going to begin by distracting the enemy's attention. We're going to take him under long-range fire from a 50 caliber machine gun and two snipers using O3 Springfield. While he's looking in this direction, we're going to start the real attack from the other flank. We're going to send in a fire team of riflemen supporting the BAR. They're going to take cover behind those palm logs. Their job is to put suppressive fire on the pillbox, not with the idea of killing the enemy soldiers inside, because that would be a lucky shot, but with the idea of taking up so much dirt, dust, and debris around those gun ports that the enemy soldier inside can't see, he can't aim properly, maybe he even jumps back from his firing position. <coughs> Once we've accomplished that, we come in with a real threat. An M3A1 Stuart tank is going to come through that gate, a moving wall of steel manning a 37mm main gun. It will engage the pillbox with its own weapons and draw the enemy's fire toward it. But the real attack is advancing under the cover of the tank, the assault squad. Thompson submachine gun, the uh, flamethrower, and satchel charge, whose job is to get close enough to destroy the pillbox in a corkscrew and blowtorch attack. What you're about to see, what you're about to hear, and what you're about to feel is very much as it would have been 55 years ago on one of those Pacific Islands with a couple of important exceptions. Exception number one, nobody's in that pillbox shooting back at us. That's a very important exception because it means we're going to be a lot more heroic doing this than we would have been in real life. We'll pull that involved this afternoon and these weapons are of course capable of striking from much greater ranges than we have available to us. The third difference is we're going to do it all out in the open. On a real battlefield you don't want to be out in the open because if you're out in the open you can be seen, if you can be seen you can be killed. But if we did this with 100% accuracy, we'd spend the next hour slowly circling through this tree line, trying to get close enough to destroy this pillbox before the enemy knew we were there. That would probably make for a rather long and boring demonstration. 